Good morning. This is indeed the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We welcome each of you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ to another study in the Word of God about the glory of the Word of God. I trust and pray as we uh, are embracing and really studying the Bible that you're, you're being that your mind is being renewed, is being transformed by the word. I hope that as you began to, to, to study along with us, you begin to understand what Bible study is versus Bible reading. I know I've been taking my time. I'm in the third unit, and this is the fourth lesson within that, that unit uh, going forward because what I'm doing is connecting the Old Testament and the New Testament teachings. I'm giving you the corresponding teachings uh, from Jesus Christ, some from Paul, some from Peter, because as I always say, in fit form and in function, David and I and you, we're all the same. We're elect of God, servants of God, uh, according to the word of God. And so as a result of that, we're, we're able to understand more about God as we study God from an Old Testament perspective as it relates to how he dealt with his children. And then the, his children, David in Psalm 19, 119, is responding to us uh, how powerful the word was in his life. Now, Psalm 119 can only be understood by believers. And this, this is only done once they are born again. And, and so we are hoping that this serves as a foundation, a part of what Jesus said when the just should live by faith. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, Matthew 4, 4. And all of this serves uh, as we are being conformed to the image of Christ, uh, as I would say, our sanctification process. And so, this would be part four as we continue with Gamil, or Gamel, and I'm just laying a foundation in the correlation and these principles that we're gathering in these earlier units. They'll be part of the whole teaching and we won't have to go over them. And indeed, I'll be able to do a unit maybe in two sessions. And, and so uh, let us prepare ourselves for our lesson this morning. And in doing so, call a friend. Get your family together. Don't just use it as a time to listen to the lesson while you're driving somewhere or listening to the lesson while you're uh, working. Take the time out together as your private devotion and let the Spirit of God speak to your heart. The eternal God, our Father, whose throne is in heaven, whose name is worthy to be praised, whose name is above all names, for there indeed is none lacking unto you. And indeed, you have no comparison. You are God alone. And in your providence and sovereignty, you rule according to your divine plan and purpose as it relates to the redemption of mankind. We, we thank you for the privilege to study your word in an environment without retaliation, retribution, and or fear. And to thank, O oh Lord, that you loved us enough that we would have tried to maneuver through the maze of this world, which is controlled by the prince of the power of the air. But you've laid down guidelines and steps to follow, and that step is your word. I pray now, O Lord, that you would open up our eyes that we might behold the wondrous things that's contained in this lesson. Because we realize that we are stranger, we understand, Lord, that the ways of a man is not in himself. Which means, O Lord, that we derive our existence, our guidance, and our direction from one or two sources. You are Satan. We're either being led by the Holy Spirit or the unholy spirit. So I pray, Lord, now that you would open up the hearts, minds of your children and allow them to behold the wonders of your word, as well as, O oh Lord, to, to receive truth, clarity and understanding pre-adventure. Maybe there's someone this morning uh, opposes themselves but to, through the truth that's being taught in love. Because only you can lead a person to repentance. And that happens as the truth manifests itself in their lives that they are convicted. And I hope, O oh Lord, through these lessons that we can in fact see this. This, O oh Lord, in all that we do can only come
come to pass if you permit. Forgive us now for our sins and transgressions through Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's go over to the third unit again, Gamal. Let thee abound to flee with thy servant that I may live and keep thy word. Open thy mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from me. My soul breaketh forth for the longing that it hath unto thy judgments at all times. Thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. Remove me from reproach and contempt, for I have kept thy testimonies. Princes also did say to speak against me, but thy servant did meditate in thy statutes. Thy testimonies also my delight in my counselor. Just, just, just uh, verse 23, I love that because it lines up with, with Romans chapter 12 when the Bible says 1221, be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. What did he say? Princes also did say and speak against me, but I, thy servant did meditate in thy statutes. I did not retaliate. What did I do? I meditated and studied the word of God. Oh, that we could grab hold of these principles and apply them across the board each and every day of our lives. So, let's look. We, we dealt with verse 17, be abound to be with thy servant, that I may live and keep thy word. Open mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Now, we're going to look at the second part of verse 17, that I may live uh, and keep thy word. Okay, that's what we're going to look at. Now, upon completion of this lesson, the student would understand the following. That's a source of life for the believers found in the word of God. In this life, we are kept by the word of God. The believer must desire to keep the word of God, and only God can enable the believer to discern the wonders of God's word. So, verse 18 was a prayer for insight, and now we're going to look at that second part that I, my personal determination, may live my personal desire and keep that word, my personal devotion. Why? Why? Because if this is a reality of David, it should also be a reality of ours. And this lesson is going to tell you why. I need you, please. You need to follow me. Uh, moment by moment, because I'm going to be going back and forth between scriptures to reveal some truths from the Hebrew text. Now, he says, the word study live is the word call y'all, meaning how life remain alive or sustain life. Now, watch me take my time with this and, and listen. What life is he talking about? We know that this earthly house will die. To sustain life means to keep life, let it remain alive. And we're not talking about physical life here. We're talking about spiritual life. So we need to understand we're talking about spiritual life here. And here's what he, what does the Bible state about life. Luke 12, 23 through 31. We're going to look at this. So my first scripture that I'm going to use to define the why comes from Luke 12, 23 when Jesus says these words, the life is more than me, and the body is more than Raymond. Look, he didn't say a life because there is only one life. He didn't say a body. He says that when it comes to the earth, there's only one body. Now, the word life is where we want to get to. So, so far, we've looked at the word live as it relates to our text, and we're going to help to give insight to what it means to live, and we're going to take a look at it from the uh, New Testament reference the life is more than meat and the body is more than raiment. Now, that Greek word in life is sukkah, okay? Here's what it means. A living being and a living soul. That's what it talks about. In verse 23, it's talking about a living soul. Now, why is that so important? Let's go over to Genesis 2 and 7. To see what that is. And the Lord God formed of the dust of the ground. Physical. And breathed into, into what? His nostrils. The breath of life. And man became a living soul. 
spiritual. The word breath means spirit of a man. The spirit of a man was breathed into him by God, and God gave him a earthly house to live in that he formed out of the ground. And the name in the word ground is Adam. So he got his name from that which he was made, the ground. So now we're talking about spiritual life. So we understand that so far. Let's move on. Now, also, I went in, and, and let me just back up a little bit. When I went in and got the definition, I, I took various parts from the definition to further explain what I'm talking about. So here we got a living being, a living soul from the Greek word life. Then it also says, it's the seat of the feelings, desires, affections, and aversions of our heart. Okay, so this is what we're talking about. Now, so what came to me was, let's talk about the heart. We've talked, we've gone from the word live to the word life. And because of the definition we find in the word life as being the seat of the feelings, desires, affections, emotions, our heart from the word soul. Let's see why that is so important. Because all of this is going to tell you why, God, why David needed God to deal bountifully with him so that he could behold the wondrous of his law. Now, Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life that needs to come forth from. So notice one thing, how important it is. When the Bible says, Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, oftentimes that is also referred to as the heart. So, now we found the word heart. So we've gone from, from, from our live to understanding life, or how God breathed the spirit and man became a living soul. Now we're talking about the heart. Okay, now, the heart is the word leave. Okay, and it is an inner man, mind, will, heart, and understanding. Now why is that so important? It's so important not only to you and I as well as David, because number one, uh, when, we are, when we are talking about being renewed by the, trans, by the transformation of our, of our minds, what it's going to take is the word of God. And we can't understand the word of God unless God does what? Deal bountifully with us. So as we can see those things, and in that verse that follow 18, the bounty that he asks of God is to do what? Open up my eyes. Now watch, watch, watch this. Whatever is in the heart of a man will show itself in the man's actions. Let's talk about some biblical references here. See, we got a lot of people today profess, proclaim to be children of God and manifest nothing that even validates their, their, their lives overtly. Why? Because I think in these days and times, and, and, and I, I'm going on record with this, we all need to ask ourselves a question. Am I really saved? If I can continue in my sin and there is no conscious awareness, no conviction, and the Bible says if you continue with, that is you can meditate sin, your life is never brought up under the subjection of the Holy Spirit, then there's, there's something wrong here. It might not always be about carnality. Carnality usually gives us an excuse for being the way we are. Maybe the problem is we have never been truly saved. Because the Bible, will, the Bible in no uncertain terms reminds us in Matthew 7, many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, did not we come to Sunday school? Lord, Lord, did not we sing in the choir? Lord, Lord, did not we work on the finance committee? Lord, Lord, did we not do this? Lord, Lord, did we not do that? He will say, depart from me, thy workers of iniquity, because if I don't know you. There are several times in the Bible that God makes some statements that will cause your heart to shiver in fear. And one of those is just that, I don't know you. And when he told the rich farmer that had a bumper crop, he says, you fool. Those are very frightening claims and assertions to come out the mouth of the God of creation to tell a man, I don't know you. That's deep. The question is, how many people in, in, in the body of Christ these days do God do God really even know versus 
that even know God. We have played, we have taken the script and we've rewritten it and we have left God out. We've turned this into a social environment. And like I always say, for some, it's a hangout. For some, it's a hideout. For some, it's a handout. But the reality is about Jesus. And, and, and every, we want everything out of it except him. We are living in a time. Let me just keep continue to add some. We're living in a time that we need to quit playing church and playing with our souls. Let's move on. When we talk about the reality of a heart, Genesis 6, 5, what did God say? And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil. Continually, the malice is evil. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know the magnitude of evil. Mark 7, 21 says, out of the heart, or from within, or out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts and adulteries, fornications, murderers, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All of these evil things come from within and defile the man. That's the manner of the evil that comes out of a man's heart. And here's the problem. If the Holy Spirit is not putting you in check, as it relates to being in the kingdom of God, wherein the Holy Spirit is at work in our heart, we, we, need, we need to sit down and seriously consider the fact about my salvation and is there any evidence? Continually with that word heart uh, from Proverbs 4.23 where it says, keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues. We talked about that. There's also another part to hear, A, B, that is, when we talk about the heart, the inclination, resolution, and determination of the will. What? Out of the heart, your will. Now, when Matthew 6, 10 says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, the word, the lema, is the Hebrew, or is the Greek word, meaning what God wishes to be done by us. The choices we make according to the word, our feelings according to the word, our desire according to the word, and our pleasure according to the word. This is what God wants from us. But now let's take a look at, at, at some things as, as the Bible talks about uh, God needing to teach us. And the only way God can teach us is to open up our eyes. That's, that, and see, this is the implication of what David says because this is, implies the reason for his questioning, asking God. And now you're going to see his reasoning, which is which is being made laid before you, which means that you're going to have to ask God to teach you what you need to know. And it starts with asking God you know, to save you and receive the finished work of Christ on the cross. And that can only happen if God's desire for you. See, we walk around in a verb confident manner. I'm saved and I'm going home. I'm going to be with heaven. This is no time to play about your salvation. What did Job say? Teach me. And I will hold my tongue and cause me to understand wherein I've erred. Psalm 25 5 says, lead me in thy truth and teach me. Why? For thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. David also says in Psalms 119 66, Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed thy commandments. Psalms 143.10, teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of, of righteousness. See, we need to be taught and led and directed by God. And God does that how? Through his word. And the only way we can understand that God's going to have to deal bountifully with each of us. And we're going to have to ask God to open up our understanding, our eyes, so that we can understand clearly. In other words, we're asking God for a spirit of discernment. And this is why Bible study is so dull. Sunday school is so dull. 
No one wants to invest in the time of the word because you know what? I go back to the book of Acts uh, when, when Paul was on the Damascus road and Christ spoke to him. And he, 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 he relayed that event several times in the book of Acts about his conversion. But what I always see amazing about that is that God spoke, but only Paul heard them. The rest of the people said that there was thunder or things of that sort, which means they didn't hear from God. The same thing happens in a Bible study, in a Sunday school class, even, even now, or even worship service, that it's just noise. And, and because it is noise, there's no stimulation of the soul to desire more. We're not made happy. We're not confirmed. We don't find joy, comfort, and peace in the midst of our circumstances. So therefore, we sit there, and there is no praise for God because we, we don't have anything to thank him for because, number one, we don't know him because we don't know his word. Now, let's talk about the word conscience. The heart, again, we're dealing with words associated with heart. What does the conscience say? It's the soul as distinguishing based on the word between what is morally good and bad, prompting to do the former and shun the latter, commending one and condemning the other. Romans 9, 1, what did Paul say? I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Ghost. Let's talk about this. How does this work? The Holy Spirit validate our conscience when I make a decision to do something as it relates to a circumstance. If I do something against the word of God, the Holy Spirit, which I should not grieve or what quench, the Holy Spirit either affirms or convicts me. Here's what he's saying. The Holy Spirit bears witness that I'm telling you the truth in the Lord. It's, it's a shame, though, when we should be made conscious, aware of, that we are wrong in the things that we say and do, and when we say them and when we do them, and there is no conscious awareness for one or two reasons. We're not born again, or when the Holy Spirit tells us that we're wrong, we're going to do it anyway. Then that's where we start to get into grieving the Holy Spirit. Now, goes back. God, I need to, you to open my eyes so I can understand, so I can distinguish that which is bad and which is good, that I know what your will is. And then in our case, the Spirit lives in us. And so the Spirit leads, guides, and I direct us according to the Word of God, which is why you need, we all need to study the Word of God. Now, when the believer has to make a decision on their actions, there is an internal witness of the Holy Spirit to validate that decision according to the Word of God. And there are several ways that the believer can respond to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 1, this I say, walk in the spirit, listen, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's obedience. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, quench not the spirit. That's opposition. Opposed to what the, you know. See, we know right and wrong. We just choose sometimes to do what we want to do because of our feelings and not operating out of faith. Ephesians 4, 30, it says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto their redemption. That's just obstinance. We either we in opposition or we're just downright just obstinate and determine we're going to do what we want to do. But go right, go go back to David. David don't want to do that. David want to know what God's will is for his life. So therefore he want God to show him that he might do what? Understand the wondrous things coming out of, that, out of his law. And one of those wondrous things is that it's that by the word of God, I am being conformed to the image of Christ. Now, several things we want to look here. The consideration of life as it relates to the providence of God. Okay, here we go. Now, Luke said that life is more than meat and drink and clothing. Did he say that? Okay. Now, let's, let's look at, at, at what else he says, because this is verse 24. Consideration of life as it relates to the providence of God. 
Consider the ravens, he says, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have store has nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? He talked about the providence of God as it relates to animal life. This is what he's saying. David is talking about spiritual life, whereby we focus on physical life. He's talking about the, 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 the beauty of, 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 of spiritual life because here's what he's saying. I want to live and remain alive. He wasn't addressing his physical condition. We shouldn't either because we know what? It's appointed unto man to die once. Then he goes to verse 25. And which of you with taking thought can add to his what? Statue, one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? That's the providence of God as it relates to man. Just like God can take care of the animal life, God would also take care of man. So you should be as trusting of God as the animals are. It's amazing. Man being the highest order of animal kingdom is the only one of his of God's creations that will not obey and trust God. Why? Animals do it instinctively. Man has a choice. And he disconnected from God in the garden. And, we, and this is why we are the way we are today. And we'll be that way without Jesus. Now, verse 27. Consider the lilies how they grow. They toil not. They spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. The providence of God as it relates to plant life. Now, here's what he says. He's now he, he has presented God's providence in all of his creation. Then he says, listen. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? He says a presumption. Let's consider this based on the providence of God. Okay, we, we are able to come from uh, a point of fact to a a a deduction that should relate to the believer, which should serve as a foundation of our faith. Because I always talk about living your our lives in light of the providence of God. Now, here's the problem as it relates to the providence of God. O ye of little faith, we don't have faith in, in the belief of the providence of God unless God gives us what we want. So we don't want to trust God for us. For, for, for what God wants. We want to put the cart before the horse. Mm. But what is the right posturing of our lives? Here's what he says. O ye of little faith. Then he said, and seek not ye, ye what ye shall eat or drink, and neither be ye of doubtful mind, the doubtful mind that God will not provide for you. Here's what he says. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your father knoweth that you have need of these things. Process based on the providence of God. The process of God taking care of you. He says, the clarification to life uh, as it relates to the providence of God. What's the clarification? But rather seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, when we seek the word of God, we're seeking the kingdom of God because the word of God defines the kingdom of God. This is the proper order of life. That's why David asked God to enable him to discern the spiritual things of his wondrous word. Now, let's talk about the cooperation. I want to cooperate with some cooperation here of life as it relates to the plan of God. So how does this work? Let's talk about God's plan in my life. First of all, the thief cometh not but for the steal and to kill and destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The source of life. That's Jesus Christ. He was the word made what flesh. That's why it's so important. In his own desires, these are the things that is in David's own desire for God's word. These are the implications in the New Testament. Why? John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. 
in him was life. And life was the light of men. This is the substance of life. The source of life is Jesus Christ and the substance of life is found in him. Why? Because he represents the hope of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And let's talk about the superiority of life. He says, it's the spirit that quickeneth, that makes you alive. And the flesh profiteth nothing. That's why David didn't ask God to behold the wondrous things that he might live. He was talking spiritual life, not physical. Okay, but here's what, what John says. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The superiority of life is found in the word of God, which the spirit of God leads us once we are born again. So that's the second part when he says, you know, that um, when he asked him to deal abundantly with, it, abundantly with him, that I might what? Live and keep thy law. That's why. What he said is what's being implied by the New Testament. So that's what we've just gone over. So now you know. So now let's go to verse 18. We're going to get as far into this as we can, not to over, overrun our, 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 a lot of time. Now, he asks for God to deal bountifully with him. Now, here's another prayer. How is it that he wants God to deal bountifully with him? Open that in my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of their law. Now, when we talk about the acrostic, here's what I use calls me to understand the wonderful things that are contained in your law. Let's take a look at these three things. Prayer. Open down my eyes. Purpose. That I may behold wondrous things out of that law. The principle. Man in his natural state cannot understand the things of God to do to the to, to due to his sinful nature. That's a prayer right there. Personal prayer. As you, you're getting ready to study the word of God, you've already addressed God. You've asked God for forgiveness. And you said, Father, please open my eyes. Give me clarity and understanding, Lord, Lord, because I know, Lord, the natural man cannot understand the things, Lord, that come from you, and they can only be understood through the Holy Spirit. So I ask, oh Lord, following the illustration of what you did for Lydia and the Emmaus disciples, Lord, so that I might behold the wondrous things contained in your law, Lord, and that I can be transformed by the renewing of my mind, Lord, in doing so. My light will shine and I will become salt as I prove to a dying world what is that perfect and acceptable will. Be that glorified in all that I ask, O Lord, and fulfill the promise of your word as it relates to your plan and purpose for mankind. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, I'm not showing off. I'm just showing you what happens to you when you study the word of God. And, and, and what I found about the ineptitude, the spiritual ineptitude in the body of Christ today is because this is a life-changing, life-going-on process. This goes back, this is 44 years on my journey with God at this level. And most people say, well, you supposed to? No, I don't. You're supposed to. Because what makes you so ineffective and the spiritual growth never happens because you don't think you know how to pray about I need a new job, I need a new house, I need some more money, I need, I need, I need. But what about what God needs? We have rewritten the script. And we have changed it to meet our needs. Ponder what I say, may God give you understanding. It's true. Now let's move on a little bit. The word open in the Hebrew language is the word, listen, G A W. L-A-W, God law, meaning, listen, to disclose or reveal in the New Testament is means to cause to understand. That's all. He said, Lord, help me to understand. <laughs> now, why is the psalmist praying in this fashion? First of all, let's look at it from Jesus' viewpoint. And what did Jesus say? Matthew eleven twenty five. 25. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Because 
the implication of what David is saying, the revelation concerning the things of God can only come from God through the Holy Spirit. That's why, what is it? First, it's uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 1. It's around about verses 17 where Paul says, for this call that I bow down my knees. Okay. Go, go look at that. And, and here's, what, here's what he asks. God, that he would give he would give the church a spirit, a spirit of wisdom and knowledge in the revelation of him. He prayed for that. Paul never prayed that God give anybody anything physical. Because if we seek to be first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things will be added. We live so far out of fellowship with God that we run into the complications of life and it just seems like we can't make it. It's not God's fault. Okay? Jesus also said in Matthew eleven twenty seven, all things have been committed to me by my Father. This is Jesus. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And who does the Son choose to reveal the Father to? The elect. Now, talking about the elect. Oftentimes people confront me when I mention about salvation. Well, God's going to choose who he wants. That's not the point. I don't know who the elect is. I'm like Paul, I become thing, all things to all men. That I might win some. See, to me, that is a very fatalistic point of view. Because if I had any doubts whether or not I would be elect, and I, I felt any conscious awareness about my soul, I would be on my knees day and night crying. But here's the problem. The God of this age has blinded the hearts of mankind. And it blinds the hearts of people in the church who become indifferent. So much so that he makes them think they're saving their lives. John 1.18 says, No man has seen God at any time. The only God the Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So this is from Jesus' viewpoint. Why he needed to pray what he did. What about from God's viewpoint? Here's what he says. Seek the Lord. Isaiah 55, 6 through 9 while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will freely pardon. He addresses the all-existing one and the all-powerful one. Here's why. We need God to open up our eyes because for my thoughts are not your thoughts. We don't think like God. Our ways are not God, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. That's why. Uh, Psalms 50, 21. These things you have done, and I have kept silent. You thought I was altogether like you, but I will rebuke you and accuse you to your face. As I said, read all of Psalms 50. But here's what we have here. We have these people, like so many of us, we have the God of our imagination that we figured to be something like us. And therefore, we see God in light of how we see ourselves. That's not God. So we've seen it from Jesus' viewpoint. We have seen it from God's viewpoint. But what does Paul say? 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16. The man without the spirit, which means... He's not born again. And man comes into the world without the Holy Spirit because he's spiritually dead. Listen, does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. I love, I love church uh, meetings and organizational opportunities to discuss things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And you watch how they always bring in worldly examples. Why? That's all they know. They don't know anything about God, the things of God, or the kingdom of God. Here's what he says. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment, because until you know God, you don't know me. Because if you know God, you know me after, after God's perspective on me. And so therefore, when people don't understand you because they don't know God, 
then they'll try to understand you through the flesh. Then they're going to start to judge you and make all accusations against you. And you just remind yourself, no man can judge another man's servant. Verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ, another uh, expression from the Holy Spirit. Now, let's talk about the Spirit's role in our understanding. It is deep. You need to understand this. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 16, but it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. Now, most people will stop right there because that sounds good. Here's what it says if you leave it there, that no one can understand the things of God. Oh, I used to do that because it sounded good years and years ago until I started getting into the Word. And I'm talking about going, er, going early back in my ministry. I've been, I've been on this journey for 44 years. And these, you know, you hear this often because the truth is in verse 10, God has revealed them unto us. What? The things which he has prepared for them that love him. For example, how has that been revealed? Let me give you an example. What did Paul say? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. What does John tell us? He saw a new heaven and earth. He saw a place where God would wipe away the tears of our eyes. That's revelation. We can only see that through the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now, that word revealed, let me do a little bit of Greek here, is the word apocalypto, where we get the word apocalypse going to Revelation to make known, make manifest, disclose what before was unknown. And here's what I love it. Man always tried to shortcut his life to try to get something for nothing. But you'll never get to heaven on, on, on the flower beds of ease. You can never shortcut your way to heaven. The only way to heaven is by the way of the cross. And if you don't know Jesus, you're not going to make it. And something else, if you're not born again, you're not going to understand the word of God. 1 John 2.20 says, but you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. Talk about the Holy Spirit. I know all things because they are, because the Holy Spirit knows all things. I have the capability to know all things, and I will find these things out as I study the word of God, and the Holy Spirit revealed that to me. 1 John 2.27, but the anointing which you have is the same thing as the unction from the Holy One, of him abideth in you, the Holy One, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you all things, and is truth and is no lie, even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. So that doesn't negate the fact of teachers, pastors, teachers, and these are these are things of that sort. Okay? We proclaim and explain, and the Holy Spirit teaches you what is proclaimed or explained or what you read. That's still an investment on your part. And whatever you are taught, you should abide in him. Now, two characteristics mark, mark genuine Christians in contrast to the Antichrist. This is what this is talking about. The Holy Spirit guards us from error. The reason we are so quick to pick up something new and, and, and make it out our, our, our teaching is because we don't listen to the Spirit. And nine times out of ten, what we pick up is something that satisfies our flesh and ease our spiritual conscience as it relates to God. Here we go. Christ, as the only one, imparts the Holy Spirit as their revealing guardian from what? Deception. Second, the Holy Spirit guides a believer into knowing all things. Look up these scriptures. True Christians have a built-in lie detector and preserve and or persevere in the truth. Those who remain in heresy and apostasy manifest the fact that they were never genuinely born again. Apostasy means to be set apart from. See, two things about the word of God. We, we walk away or we are drawn away. Matthew 13 the sword goes and sows seed. There are a lot of things that choke 
the word of God, number one, it has no foundation. The troubles and the cares of this world, Satan comes and steals it out of us. That's why I always say, and I said and always, it just come up in a couple of my teachings. You see some Christians just, just barely, just barely surviving. Others are thriving because of the word of God. What does 1 Corinthians 2 11 says? For one man knoweth the things of a man except for the spirit of a man which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. That's the limitations on man's wisdom. David realized he had a limitation on his wisdom. That's why he asked God open. 12. 1 Corinthians 2 11 and 12. Now we have received not the spirit of this world which is the God of the age or the prince of the power of the air but the spirit which is of God the Holy Spirit that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. In Ephesians 2, 2. Who is the spirit of the world? Where in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Let me just show you there is no gray area. Either you're being controlled by the spirit of God or by the spirit of the devil. There's just no gray area. You choose. Verse 13 says, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Mm -hmm. Listen to what Paul has to say. Now, back in the day, the Spirit of God did not stay in men. The Spirit of God came upon men. So, therefore, God operated in the same manner. But the difference is the Holy Spirit lives in us and is with us. So we understand the distinctive difference of the world's wisdom and uh, divine wisdom. It's called devilish wisdom versus divine wisdom. Uh, I continually keep this verse before you in my uh, previous teaching. When did James say, who is wise and endure with knowledge among you? A lot of Christians believe they are. He said, let him show good out of a good conversation where he lives by his works with meekness of wisdom. And listen to what he says. But if you have bitter and envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and what devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceful, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy, good fruits without partiality, and without hypocrisy. James was addressing, addressing some issues in the church, but notice how he approached it. Because what's happening, if divine wisdom is not working in your life, it's because devilishness, devilish wisdom is taken over. And it's amazing how we will align ourselves with the devil against the word of God. And here we go again. Verse 14. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, and neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Now, in verse 14 through 16, Paul takes up the subject of illumination. Illumination is God's intervention on our behalf for a believer to understand the Word of God. First, Paul deals with the why the non-believer cannot understand divine wonders. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Watch this. The word natural man means soulish. We get the word psychology from this. And from this word, the natural man is all soul, no spirit. No spiritual connection to God at all. He's pure psychology and no spirit. That's what all humanism designed that defines itself within man's own uh, opinion and nature and perspective on himself. He has natural capacity, but no spiritual capacity. He does not have the capacity to relate to God because he has had only one birth. He has not had a second birth. He may outwardly be very moral, righteous, but in, inwardly, he is dead to God. You got a lot of people in church like that. They look spiritually alive, but they're dead to God. Why? You know, they're not born again. Now, a soulless man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. He has no capacity to appreciate divine truth. God's word does not penetrate his thinking, and the word received means to embrace. He does not embrace the word of God into his soul because he is self-sufficient in his soul. Why? Because he doesn't have the spirit of God. That's another reason people don't attain the Bible study. 
Because when you take a look and consider maybe hundreds of link goes out around various places, states, and stuff like that, and you might roughly get about 20%, what's wrong with the other 80? They're foolish because they don't think they need God. Anybody that will not make time for God, God will not make time for them because here's what he says, if you are ashamed to own me before men, I will be ashamed to own you before my father and I'm going to ask you a question. Whatever it is that takes more of your time than God, will that get you to heaven when you die? Going back to verse 14 and, and looking at that second part, for, the, for they are foolish, foolishness to him. What is that? The things of the Spirit of God are foolishness to him. He has negative desire towards divine truth because he can't understand it. And that's why Bible study gets to be dull. The rest of that verse says, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Now the word discern is the word judge. A judge makes a distinction as to who is innocent or who is guilty. He makes a distinction between opinion and fact. The non-Christian does not have the faculty to make judgments about the word of God because he's spiritually dead. And the best thing they can offer you is their opinion and advice. Don't listen to it. Now, what these types of people, what do we know about them? What we know about them is defined in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4. But even if our gospel is, is veiled, this is what Paul said to the church at Corinthians, it is veiled or blinded to those who are dying. Why? Because the minds, who minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe least the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them and would save them. Let me tell you something. People say, well, you know, I believe devil believes and they tremble too. I can believe that there is a God. But until I understand the implications of that through conviction, I'm not going to receive it or accept it. They believe, but they don't understand. So what's the principle to all of this? And keep this in mind. While I've been going through this, it tell, it, this is the implications of what David is saying in the Old Testament. And this is what the New Testament is telling us why David did what he did. And we should be doing the same thing every time we study the Bible. What's the principle? The non-believer does not possess the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. The non-Christian lives purely on the human or material level. The non-believer has a perception of handicap to spiritual things. He therefore lacks the faculty to know God. He begins with himself and ends with himself. He exists in a purely human condition. He's like a blind man who cannot see the sun. He's spiritually blind and he cannot see, uh, uh, physically blind, you can't see the S-U-N. Spiritually blind, you can't see the S-O-N. He's all that he needs. He does not need God. He is kind as long, he is kind as long as he can have his own way. Romans 8, 7 says of this, the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God nor indeed can be, which means these people are the enemy of God. But then he says in verse 15, but he that is spiritual, one who is filled with and governed by the spirit of God, judge of all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. You ever hear some people say, you know, I'm, I'm not a Christian, but I'm spiritual. But the Bible says, if you say you're spiritual, you are one who is filled with and governed by the Spirit of God, according to the Greek. And he judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man, because everything is always referenced to the Word of God. Now, here's what he says. But he who is spiritual judges all things. The believer has a built-in Bible teacher, the Holy Spirit, that stands in contrast to the non-believer who cannot interpret spiritual truth. We talked about that previous verse. It is the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit to give an understanding of the Bible to the believer. And God gave revelation and inspired the writing of the apostles. But he provides understanding of the word of God to all believers. The believer that can judge or evaluate spiritual things by their true standard, which is the word of God, which these things have already been judged. David calls them God's judgments, and God's judgments are found in the word of God. He can come to believe properly 
and apply truth to experience. He can judge all things in contrast to the believer who can not discern spiritual things. Ephesians 1.18, I mentioned that. What did Paul pray? The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints. And then I close this lesson with that reiteration of 1 John 2.27 when he says, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you and you need not need or you do not need that anyone teach you but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie and just as it has taught you you will abide in him okay now you know from the New Testament perspective why David mentioned what he did about God needing to open his eyes. Now you know. And we need the same thing. So I trust and pray that you have received some enlightenment. This is what you call Bible study, not Bible reading. I hope these things really enhance your desire to further and take your Bible study to another level. Because you might go a lifetime and only understand thoroughly maybe one book. That's more than some people do. Don't waste your time, people. The time that is now to getting to know God. And the only way you can is through his word. God bless you and keep you until next week's lesson. And we'll further our study of verse 18.